Okay, 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 okay. This is Think Tech, and I'm Jay Fidel, and this is a show called It Never Got Quiet. In fact, I think we should be concerned if it does get quiet, but it never got quiet. That's the name of the show. And we're talking about how the end of the draft affected the military and how it affected the country since then, from the middle 70s till now. And for this very dis important discussion, we have Vic Kraft. He used to be the host of It Never Got Quiet a couple of years ago. Welcome back to your show, Vic. Nice to see your smiling face. Great to be here, Jay. Yeah. So, okay, the draft ended, you know, and I'm sure you remember the time that it did. I'll tell you just to warm things up that when I when I heard they were ending the draft of Gerald Ford, it was, I think, um, I was very concerned because I saw a diminution of the relationship between the people, uh, the citizens, if you will, and the state. And that was of concern to me. What was your reaction at the time? Curiously, I had a hallway conversation uh, with one of our uh, maintenance officers one day when this happened. And I was still on active duty at the time. And I said, uh, I said there's a great danger here uh, as far as uh, the leavening of the, uh, the, the people that we have within, uh, uh, that we're going to enlist. What kind of a, a recruit are we going to find uh, from the population, from, uh, from the American uh, populace, that we're going to recruit, train, and uh, make warfighters out of. And where are they coming from? What's their background? So with the draft, we had a much wider variety of people from all different aspects of life and all different economic backgrounds, religions, etc. cetera. Uh, we started to start getting less and less of a, a variety of people. And the minority uh, in, or let's put it this way, what we were concerned with at that time was those with a lower uh, education came from a, an economic background that was uh, not as pleasant as uh, middle class America, looked, looking to the military as being a way of getting out of that, uh, that environment, mm -hmm. not as a career so much as a way to escape. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that, uh, but that leads to consequences. Uh, so, what consequences did you see at the time? Uh, uh, did you were you concerned about the relationship of government and the electorate? Not so much at that time. Uh, I think what it amounted to, we were concerned with the immediate, and that was, what is the result of uh, of this? Uh, the government, particularly the Navy and the Air Force, I don't know about the Army, but we ch changed the training and started cutting back. Uh, budgets were more important, uh, uh, uniform uh, allocations, etc. Just it was all about money at that time, and yeah. cutting back and cutting back and cutting back. And we were concerned primarily with warfighting ability, uh, in in terms of what kind of uh, armaments were we going to be getting, what weapons, and you stop to consider that. Better than 55% of the budget of the, of the Department of Defense actually goes to paying people, not just salaries, but also in uh, retirement and uh, mm -hmm. disability. Mm -hmm. So that other 45% is all the operations and maintenance, uh, procurement, and everything else that goes in there. But you look at today in terms of what we are spending as a country on our arms, or the Department of Defense budget, we outstrip everybody. Uh, I think the next seven uh, leaders in terms of uh, defense spending can come close to what the United States is spending. And that includes Russia, China, uh, Japan, Germany. So we're not, we're not spending as much as we used to in a, a relative way, huh? Uh, probably not, but it's what we're spending it on. That, uh, that's what concerns us. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we still have a problem Ever since the end of the Cold War, uh, who's our enemy? And I, I don't think the Russians ever went away, and everybody's looking at China as being the bad guys. Well, uh, you're, you're going to have a hard time transporting their army anywhere outside of Asia. Uh, they don't have the logistics. Uh, they don't have the wherewithal to do it that the United States does. We can plant troops anywhere on the planet mm -hmm. uh, and still support them. Uh, we're the largest armed forces uh, in the world in terms of uh, expenditures and also armaments, not necessarily in terms of people. 
that belongs to the Chinese. They can put more boots on the ground than we can. You haven't mentioned the Middle East. Of course, the Middle East is a big factor today, and uh, you know there's arguments on both sides of the United States being the world's policeman and sending all these fast-moving mobile troops into the Middle East to do whatever the commander-in-chief decides on a given morning they should be doing. Uh, how is that working, do you think? In my conversations with a lot of the troops that have come back from Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, even Egypt and various other places in the world that uh, uh, I had one major uh, say, he couldn't tell me where he had been, but I knew where he had been because I had been there myself. And uh, I said, uh, what, what's the reaction? What are the, how do the troops feel about this? And they, uh, he said they know they're being used. Uh, what's the mission? Uh, and I've asked the question in, in uh, Civil Beat and a couple of other places. Uh, what, what is our, uh, our policy? What, what is our, our interest? Uh, we keep hearing from Congress and from uh, various leaders in, in government. Uh, we have a mission where we have American interests to protect in those, in those areas. Well, what are the American interests? I don't think they've ever been spelled out. Mm -hmm. Well, it reminds me of, uh, you know, after World War II, where we saw ourselves as the policemen for the world and um, corrected a lot of bad things that were happening at the time. Um, we were, um, we had the greatest generation and yeah. uh, we were on a roll in the sense that we had greater prestige, greater influence, greater authority, not only on a military level or a geopolitical level, but on an economic level, sure. on a, a, a foreign policy level. We were really in great shape because of, because of what we had done. We were heroes for a long time. Sure. Knocking the draft off, I thought, was a, I thought was a step backward in the sense that um, all of a sudden uh, we were not willing, to, uh, not willing to be what we said we wanted to be. And over time, look what happened. Uh, we had we had a you know a decline of our influence. We had a decline of our policy, as you say. Um, we had a decline of the um, you know about our hero status. And right now, I don't know if you can say we're a hero. We're a grandstander, as we saw in the last couple of days in India with uh, Premier Modi um, and uh, and Trump. But are are we still a hero? Um, and I think there's a relationship between. Uh, being a hero and, and having a military does her heroic things. And I agree with you that what, what happens in the Middle East, we are really not, we're not a hero. We're not achieving anything, which it sounds like it's more political than anything else. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't really done anything heroic there. Uh, every time we do something, it seems like it's more like anti-heroic. But let me, let me go to the question of how uh, the public in the United States sees the military how the press sees the military, how other people elsewhere see the military post-draft. Let me back you up a little bit. Yeah. Let's go back to the end of World War II. Okay. Typically, uh, America has uh, been suspicious of its military. Uh, that's how the Constitution has been written in that uh, this, it, it takes second, it does not take precedence. Uh, it's under a commander in chief who is a civilian uh, and he must follow the orders of the civilian hierarchy. Well, at the end of World War II, uh, we didn't immediately become the world's cop. As a matter of fact, we started disbanding uh, divisions and uh, we went from the largest armed force in the world to where we we're starting to take World War II era tanks and putting them on pedestals. Yeah, just as we did after World War I. Yeah, and, and the, th the funny part about that was when uh, Korea started up, those tanks had to be taken off the pedestals to be used in Korea. So it was, uh, we just, okay, war's over, uh, we won, done, let's get on with the, the business of being the greatest country in the world. Mm -hmm. So Korea, the Korean conflict, more or less changed the style of warfare, uh, becoming uh, political and becoming, uh, oh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, to, uh, when you're doing something for somebody else, Basically, they Altruistic. were altruistic. Uh, no, they they were <laughs> they were doing the Russians' bidding is what it amounted to. Okay, and uh, so the Chinese got thrown into it, and uh, you had all of these uh, other uh, people fighting the UN forces, and I think that's the last time the Russians ever walked out on the Security Council after that vote. Mm -hmm. But what happened uh, is warfare changed, and the draft was still in in effect. And uh, you, it still wasn't enough. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was uh, a Marine 
reservist who was called up, hadn't even been to basic training, hadn't been to uh, infantry training regiment, thrown on a boat and sent to uh, uh, Korea to be a part of the 1st uh, Marine Provisional uh, Brigade. So it was, a, we have today since then a, a war, uh, come as you are, where it's going to be quick and dirty if it's going to be nuclear or if it's going to be large armies. It's not going to be a sustained effort. However, what we've d learned in the Middle East is it's protracted. Now, why? I don't know. What are our interests other than uh, protecting Israel? Uh, is there any great resource that we're after other than oil? Well, oil is big. Yeah. I mean, the energy is huge. Uh, it, it runs our society or our, our civilization. So that's important, but in, I look at Syria and Turkey going at it now, and you have essentially a, a Russian ally going against a NATO country, but that NATO country has been making overtures to the Russians. So it's kind of screwy as to what's going on there. But in terms of getting back to your question, as far as what the armed forces are doing today and how they are reacting. Well, I, I want to I flush that out a little bit for you. Yeah. You know, I saw a couple of days ago, I don't know if I told you, I saw um, the uh, Hunters series on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And it, it's had reviews on both sides of the coin, but it certainly is a very engaging series. It's hard not to watch it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came out for me, uh, you mentioned that you already knew about this, uh, was Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. Operation Paperclip happened in 1945 in the United States, where the United States government uh, was um, was bringing Nazi uh, scientists, Nazi military people, um, Nazi um, technology people, Nazi doctors over here and providing jobs and work and money and homes and, and citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, a th roughly a thousand of them came over on this Operation Paperclip. I didn't know that happened. I, I don't, you know, it's a, I'm impressed that you knew. Um, bottom line, though, is that they were not, the government at the time was not transparent with us. They didn't tell us about it. This was essentially secret in 1945. Mm -hmm. I guess the people would have reacted to it if they had known about it. We just finished the war, yeah? Um, so my question to you is, um, you know, it's a question of transparency. Uh, the United States has been, relatively speaking, transparent. I, I would say on a declining basis, by the time we got to Vietnam, they were not very transparent. But how is transparency, you know, how has it been affected by these changes we're talking about uh, post-Vietnam, post the end of the draft? I had an interesting conversation with a, uh, uh, a former state legislator about politics. Uh, uh, I think you know Jim Sean. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we were chatting about uh, what politics is all about. And it's supposed to be transparent. That is, you know, a politician is supposed to be a person who brings issues to debate and is also, uh, this is a, a, an open forum where things are discussed. You got to ask yourself a question, at what point in time did government start lying to the people? Yes. Does it go back to the Revolutionary War? Maybe. War of 1812? Maybe. Uh, don't know. Uh, I, I can't pinpoint a, a spot where that happened. Maybe it's part, it's part of the arrangement, you know. There's always a well certain be. lack of transparency. Sure. And at the end of the day, it's a question of degree. No? Yeah. And uh, I mean, if it's for the national interest in terms of national security, there are loads of things that we don't know uh, uh, in regards to our war fighting capability and what we have uh, hidden behind the closed doors uh, or what our, our war plans are. You stop to think about all the war plans that have been created, like War Plan Orange and War Plan Rainbow uh, prior to World War II uh, in preparation for that conflict. And uh, it wasn't made public. Uh, do you want to make, let your enemy know what your plans are? Oh yes, of course. And and I would say that's a, a you know a definite exception from from the requirement of transparency. Mm -hmm. But I think we have a lot of less than transparent actions by government, uh, silences by government of things that would would not affect the uh, the mission, uh, things that already happened, uh, things that might be embarrassing perhaps. Um, but but uh, that are, they do not undermine national defense. Uh, and I think my thought, and I'm interested in yours, is that over time, especially in recent years, when you don't have a, 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 dra a drafted uh, you know, army, an army with draftees, um, you only have uh, volunteers, and the volunteers are kind of, as you mentioned, a kind of closed society, um, it's easier to be less than transparent. 
it's easier to be in a container somehow where the public outside that container doesn't hear about things you don't want them to hear about. You're absolutely correct. And I think that uh, is one of the reasons why the Vietnam War ended uh, is because people had skin in the game. Uh, I had a neighbor or I had one of my relatives that was in the armed force or was going to be going into the armed force or being drafted. Uh, it was an unpopular war after a while. And uh, what are we doing here? And people started questioning that. We had the riots, we had elections, we had assassinations, etc. But in the end, uh, we pulled out of Vietnam. Uh, we didn't win the conflict, nor did we lose it either. Uh, it, it just it just ended. Uh, and we stopped the draft mm -hmm. because it was considered a bad thing. This is what got us into this uh, into this war. And in essence, I disagree with that. I think the draft was a good thing. It had a, a much wider uh, spectrum of people coming into the armed forces. Not only that, you had uh, the public's involvement. People knew about basic training. They knew where uh, we had bases. They knew about what was going on inside the armed forces and what they were doing. You couldn't keep it secret. No, you couldn't. And uh, it's it's easier today, as you pointed out, uh, having a very close society. Uh, in, uh, even with the draft, military life, as you know, you've been in, uh, it's a very segregated life. Uh, and it's a very different lifestyle. And sometimes it's us and them. Exactly. Uh, but now uh, I, I get tickled when people will ask or see, oh, you're a Vietnam veteran. Thank you for your service. And I kind of wonder, what, what am I supposed to respond with? Thank you for your service. You're welcome. Uh, I felt it was a duty at the time. Uh, exactly. I, I had the opportunity, uh, since uh, I have uh, relations in Canada, I could have gone there. And uh, my mother had already made arrangements for me to go there. And I didn't. I had already enlisted. So I want to take this process one step further, Vic, if you don't mind. Sure. You have a different military, you have, you have um, sort of different training, you have, um, I'm, I'm sure the training is different at the military academies too. It isn't the same. Um, and uh, a different career for, for sure. And different infrastructure, you know, different command infrastructure, if you will, <coughs> in the service. And <clears throat> if you look today at uh, Trump and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you look at all the generals he's hired, which was unprecedented really, uh, as uh, part of his uh, immediate staff, you know, beyond the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And you have all the, 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 the contention by those guys disagreeing with his policies and leaving the White House and writing books about it. Um, and, and then you have him spending tons of money on the military and saying, I'm, I'm doing them a favor. I want their loyalty. I want the, the military and the Joint Chiefs to be loyal. And one by one, as, they, as, the, as the ones who are independent leave his, uh, his his White House and his Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, he has greater control over the military, senior military officials who were there. And this gives me concern because this makes uh, him the commander in chief. In fact, as he said, the chief law enforcement officer in the country, <laughs> the, the one who is in charge of everything, it means there's nobody there. More and more, there's nobody there to push back. And I wonder what your comments are about that because our military and our senior military officials they're different now, mm -hmm. and they're less likely to push back the way things have shaped up during this administration anyway. What do you think? I have to have faith uh, in the officer corps. Uh, we have a, a highly trained, highly educated group of people who are motivated, uh, who are professional, when I, that's an abused term, but uh, who I think they would do right. Well, I mean, uh, the, uh, Lieutenant Commander Vindman did right. <clears throat> Look mm -hmm. what happened to him. And, and it's not over. You know, uh, Trump may uh, use undue influence on the military sure. and cause him to be investigated or prosecuted for telling the truth under subpoena at Congress. Mm -hmm. That's very concerning to me because what it, what it signals to other military officials uh, in, all, in all ranks and files in the military that maybe they, they shouldn't speak against the president even under subpoena, oh. even if what they're saying is the truth. Sure. So and what you have is a change in uh, I call it transparency, candor, if you will, by the military, and a change in the notion that uh, you know your, your duty is to the country rather than to the president. And in preparation for this uh, discussion today, you mentioned to me, which I did not know, that the oath of office 
for officers in the United States military is different than the oath of office for enlisted men That's correct. in the United States. And this is of concern uh, mm -hmm. because there seems to be kind of a conflict on who your loyalty is to. Can you describe that, please? Okay, the, the, uh, the oath of office for an officer does not uh, proclaim uh, loyalty to the president. Uh, it says to, to uh, defend the Constitution, of course, as does the enlisted uh, uh, oath. But the enlisted uh, people are giving oath or loyalty to the officers appointed above them and the president. Officers don't do that. And I felt that that was a conflict of interest. Uh, I, I would really love to see the, the, the judge advocate people get a hold of this thing or military lawyers and... Uh, understand why there is a difference in that the, the military ranks, or pardon me, the enlisted ranks, uh, have a, a different oath from the officers. Don't know, but uh, I, I wanted to comment something about uh, on what you had just said about uh, uh, loyalties. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, I mean. Yeah, I'm concerned of any executive branch or anybody trying to push the military into a corner so that we would eventually have another Praetorian Guard. That was what concerns me. Tell us what a Praetorian Guard is. <laughs> if you look back at Roman history, uh, the Praetorian Guard was uh, there to protect the emperor. Or, uh, and what happened was, uh, <laughs> over a period of time, uh, it became a corrupt government and uh, the Praetorian Guard essentially uh, elected uh, the next emperor in their guard room for whatever price that they could get. Uh, and, and you look at uh, the history of Rome from about, oh, uh, I'm trying to think about uh, the year 100 AD on, and you won't find a whole lot of these emperors surviving or, or filling out their uh, term of office. Uh, they were mostly assassinated and mostly assassinated by the military. And I would hate to see that happening here. And, uh, you know, like a, a, a seven days in May situation. Mm -hmm. We don't need that. Uh, and I think... Uh, in, in my feeling is I don't think that the officer corps would do that. However, given that the president has direct control over uh, the enlisted ranks, could he persuade them? I don't know. A direct order from the president? Is it an unlawful order? Uh, an unlawful order, of course, so you have an awful lot of uh, NCO academies on all of the services that go over the uh, uni uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice and what is a lawful order. Yeah, and then it gets a little confused uh, when you have the Gallagher case mm -hmm. where uh, the guy was convicted by, by the officer corps, I guess you'd say. In fact, the, the witnesses in that case were his own co-enlisted members of his, of his SEAL team. Mm -hmm. um, so it's officers and enlisted participated in convicting him. Uh, and then he's excused. <clears throat> and, of course, that has a message, not only to Gallagher, you're a good guy, Gallagher, but the message is to the entire military. You're a good guy, even if you've been convicted of war crimes. Uh, this is of great concern because it breaks down, you know, good order and discipline, and it, it makes war, crim war crimes uh, acceptable um, to millions of members of the service. It's like, no jury would convict me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, I mean, I think the reaction would have been greater. Uh, if the president tried to do that at another time when we had the draft, we would have all those guys in all those war movies saying, wait a minute, you know, we come from the streets of Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't tolerate this kind of bull. Yeah. You can't do that. Uh, you have to give respect to the military, you know, process here and you can't, you can't favor a war criminal. So I think what we have a, is a breakdown that already broke down, you know, since the middle yeah. 70s when, when the draft was yeah. uh, repealed and is breaking down at an accelerating, accelerating rate right now. And I think that um, you know, people in this country are further uh, than the military than they have ever been really since the war. Well, well as you know, uh, you know, Peter Adler and I wrote a, an article that appeared in the Star Advertiser calling for national service. Uh, there is such divisiveness within the country and I think, it's, it ha as you point out, it's become worse and worse since the end of the draft. And I think that's one of the reasons why. You, you no longer have, uh, as I said, family groups with skin in the game. The other is uh, you don't have this idea of working with one another. We, uh, to use the TV term polarized, you, you have people at either end of the, the spectrum and nobody in the middle. 
and nobody caring for each exactly. other. Exactly. The, the two ends hate each other. Yeah, this is really a bad situation. So let me ask you one question. We only have a few minutes left here. Uh, that sort of that sort of covers all of this. Mm -hmm. Is that if today, whether it's uh, Trump, this is very unlikely, uh, or Bernie Sanders, or any president, got out there on the on the podium and said, "I want to bring the draft back." Because I thought the draft was good for the country. It was good to integrate the government and the people. And you wouldn't grow up, you know, feeling your only contact with the United States was paying taxes. Uh, you would grow up feeling that you were part of it. You served the government. And the government serves you. Call it a quid pro quo. Uh, <clears throat> so I feel, I'm the candidate, I feel that we should bring it back. What kind of reaction would that candidate have to that particular platform position? You know, I've, I've asked the question uh, to a number of people, and uh, of course, I guess maybe it's the people that I hang around with. Everybody is in favor of it, uh, and I've, I've, be they ex-military or, or civilian or having no military experience. Uh, personally, I think it's a great idea. I've, I've written about it, uh, and I think a lot of people would agree with it, but I think you would find an awful lot of people, particularly young folks, who would be faced with this uh, as a part of their life and resent it and not want it and object to it. Yeah, and the question is whether they would resent it and not want it and object to it because they were being thrown in harm's way or because, and we have to leave it at this notion, or because they had no confidence in the United States policy, foreign policy, war policy, yeah. defense policy, to put them in a, in a, in a battle which was which was which was uh, moral and right and appropriate yeah. and uh, i think that's also a factor in why people would not want the draft just like what happened in vietnam they would sort of replay that and say gee i I'm, i don't want to fight in a stupid war uh you draft me and that's where i'll be because i don't have any confidence that the government makes intelligent wars Jay, it was it's lack of faith and laugh, lack of confidence and uh did we ever find the weapons of mass destruction did we ever see the light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, did we actually stop the uh, communism in Southeast Asia? Uh, it, it just... It, you're, you're totally right. It's philosophy. It's, it's in, uh, we, we need to... I go back to William Letterer in uh, The Ugly American. We are terrible at our foreign policy. We'll have to leave it there. there. Hopefully there's a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> That's Vic Kraft, uh, the former host and uh, a great guest on uh, It Never Got Quiet. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you so much. Aloha. Okay. Aloha.